In the book of Daniel, God repeatedly showed the prophet the evolution of four empires. The first three were clear, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. For centuries, the dominant view has been that the Roman Empire was the fourth and that the Antichrist will come from a revived version of the Roman Empire. I believed all of this for decades because it was the only interpretation I'd ever been taught. Around 15 years ago, I discovered a great Bible scholar and author named Joel Richardson. Two of his books, Islamic Antichrist and Mideast Beast, caused me to throw out my assumptions and take a fresh look at Scripture and world history. Let's start with Daniel 2.40, where he describes the fourth empire. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Daniel 2.40 The fourth empire is also described as the fourth beast in chapter 7, saying it would be different from all other kingdoms. The problem with the interpretation of Rome as the fourth empire is this. It did not crush all the others. In fact, it didn't even come close. Even at its peak, the Roman empire never came close to occupying the lands of the Greek, Medo-Persian, or Babylonian empires. Its forays into the Middle East were shallow and often short-lived. By contrast, the Islamic Empire, from the various caliphates and then the Ottoman Empire, occupied vast swaths of Daniel's first three empires, far more than the Roman Empire ever did. Keeping in mind that Daniel's prophecies all occurred while he was in Babylon, it's also notable that the first subsequent empire to occupy both Babylon and Israel was the Islamic Empire not the Roman Empire. Here's a look at Daniel's first three empires, then the Roman Empire at its peak in 117 AD. While impressive in many ways, especially its contributions to Western civilization, the Roman Empire simply did not qualify as crushing the preceding empires laid out in Daniel. Now let's take our map a step further by taking a look at the Ottoman Empire at its peak. Which one of these looks more like a force that crushed and devoured Daniel's first three empires? In addition to the vast territorial advantage the Islamic Empire had over Rome in the Middle East, its longevity dwarfed that of Rome. Beginning with Muhammad in the 7th century, then evolving through the various caliphates that sprang up following his death, and finally maturing as the Ottoman Empire that lasted until 1922, We're talking about a span of over 1,300 years. The Roman Empire lasted 503 years. To be fair, it was understandable that the early church would latch on to Rome as the fourth empire, given its control over the lands of Israel during the time of Christ and its sequential place in history following the earlier empires prophesied in Daniel. What the early Christians could not have foreseen, though, is the future juggernaut of Islam, By the time it came along, the Roman Empire theory was so entrenched that it became dogma that has persisted to this day. One thing that has caused this dogmatic attachment to the Roman theory to persist is the prophecy in Daniel 9.26. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. From Daniel 9.26. The prince referred to here is the Antichrist. And we know from Daniel 7, 19 through 20, that the Antichrist, referred to here as the other horn, will come from the fourth kingdom. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Daniel 7, 19-20 Roman adherents believe that since the Roman commander Titus, on behalf of the Roman Empire, led the attack on Jerusalem in 70 AD that ended up destroying both the city and the temple, This is proof positive that the Antichrist will emerge from a revived Roman Empire. 
But let's take a closer look at the key sentence from Daniel 9.26. With this verse on screen, let's recap. We know that the prince is the Antichrist, and we know that he will come from Daniel's fourth empire. These points are straightforward and crystal clear in Scripture. We clearly saw from the empire maps that the 1,300-year Islamic empire was a much better fit territorially and temporarily for a crushing and devouring empire than Rome ever was. The big remaining question then is what do we do with the fact that it was undoubtedly the Roman Empire that attacked Jerusalem in 70 AD? What we do is pay very close attention to detail and remember that every single word in the Bible is there for a reason. The original Hebrew word for people in Daniel 9.26 is Am. In addition to the generic translation of people, this word can also be translated as race or kindred. If we apply these translations, things get interesting. The race of the future Antichrist shall destroy the Sinti and the sanctuary, or the kindred of the future Antichrist shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Let's continue to move very carefully through this issue. Titus, a Roman commander, did lead the invasion of Jerusalem in order to put down a rebellion. But who was the race of the future Antichrist, or the kindred of the future Antichrist, who actually destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Here we'll turn to one of the most respected historians of the era, Josephus, a first-century Roman Jew who wrote extensively on the history of the Jewish people. His work, The Wars of the Jews, provides an eyewitness account of the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. What we learn there is that the rank and file who actually carried out the destruction were not Italians from Rome. They were mostly non-Jewish conscripts from the areas surrounding Judea. In other words, Israel's enemy neighbors who had been hating and fighting them for centuries. This would have included Palestinian, Persian, and Syrian auxiliaries, the ancestors of the same people who hate Israel today, who ceaselessly attack Israel today, who want to shove all the Jews into the sea today. Titus was not there to destroy the city or the temple. He was there to quell a rebellion by the Jews that threatened stability in the region. In fact, when he learned that someone had set the temple on fire, he freaked out. He did everything in his power to stop it and put the fire out, but the mob was out of control. They hated the Jews more than they feared Titus or Rome, as can clearly be seen in this excerpt from the Wars of the Jews describing the scene. Titus came in haste and endeavored to persuade the soldiers to quench the fire and gave order to Liberalius the centurion and one of those spearmen that were about him to beat the soldiers that were refractory with their staves and to restrain them, yet were their passions too hard for the regards they had for Caesar and the dread they had of him who forbade them as was their hatred of the Jews and a certain vehement inclination to fight them too hard for them also. Josephus, Wars of the Jews Now that we understand what really happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD and who actually destroyed the city and the sanctuary, Daniel 9.26 takes on an entirely different meaning. Like I said a couple of minutes ago, details matter. Every word matters. Let's visit our retranslated excerpt from Daniel 9.26 one more time. The race or kindred of the future Antichrist shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Knowing what we know now, that the Antichrist will be from the kindred or race of enemy neighbors who had such a bloodlust for the Jews in the first century, which seems more likely, a European Antichrist or a Middle Eastern Antichrist? It seems plain as day already, but we have more compelling evidence just ahead that I promise you don't want to miss. Let's hop over to the most famous apocalyptic book in history, Revelation, 
and take a look at a passage that sounds like it could be a riddle straight out of a movie. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. Revelation 17, 10 and 11. To understand this within the context of historical and spiritual convergence, especially considering the theory that the Antichrist emerges from the Islamic world, it's essential to break down this prophecy with clarity. So let's decipher the seven kings. The seven kings are empires or rulers that have exerted significant influence over God's people in the Holy Land throughout history. Here's a breakdown that aligns with the historical narrative and the notion of the Antichrist coming from the Islamic world. King 1. The Egyptian Empire was the first great empire to enslave the Israelites, representing a significant adversary of God's people. King 2. The Assyrian Empire was known for capturing the northern kingdom of Israel and dispersing the ten tribes, further scattering God's people. King 3. The Babylonian Empire, led by Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed Jerusalem and the first temple leading to the Babylonian exile. King IV, the Medo-Persian Empire. Under Cyrus the Great, it conquered Babylon and allowed the Jews to return to, to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. King V, the Greek Empire. Established by Alexander the Great, it was divided upon his death, leading to the Hellenization of the Middle East and conflicts over the Holy Land, particularly during the Maccabean Revolt. These five are the five who have fallen. King VI, the Roman Empire, in power at the time of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, and the early Christian church. The Roman Empire is the one that is, or the one that was, at the time John received the revelation of Christ. King VII, the Islamic Empire, Following the pattern and considering the emphasis on the Middle Eastern and religious context, the next great empire to exert influence over the Holy Land was the Islamic Caliphate, beginning with the Rashidun, followed by the Umayyad, Abbasid, and culminating in the Ottoman Empire. This empire, unlike its predecessors, was not only a political and military force, but also brought a new dimension that had never been seen before a religion and culture that spread by brutality, forced conversion, and subjugation, significantly impacting the Christian and Jewish populations within its territories. Remember when Daniel told us that his fourth empire would be different from all the rest? Here that is on display. King VIII, a revived empire? Here we have an eighth king who is of the seven and is headed to destruction which seems a clear reference to Antichrist, who will revive or reconstitute one of the previous empires in a new form. Considering the emphasis on the Islamic world, this could imply a modern revival of the Islamic Caliphate, as sought by various groups in the Middle East today, from ISIS's endless ragtag efforts to Turkey's president come dictator Erdogan, who openly fancies himself the new caliph. This revived empire will be the final adversary of God's people during the tribulation run by the Antichrist. And he's going to have a rough landing when King Jesus shows up. We've covered a lot, so let's pause and review what we've learned so far. We'll need this brief slowdown because the final set of evidence just ahead is, well, jolting. We know that from a territorial perspective, the Islamic Empire dwarfed Rome's conquest. We know that from a temporal perspective, the Islamic Empire lasted 1,300 years to Rome's 503. We learned that Islam met the biblical requirement of being different than all the others, religiously and culturally, as it spread by the sword and left a trail of blood wherever it went. 
we learn that Antichrist will come from Daniel's fourth kingdom. We learn that the rank-and-file soldiers who actually destroyed Jerusalem and the temple were conscripts from nearby regions filled with enmity toward the Jews. Their hatred was so hot that Titus himself could not control them. Titus was a legionary legate and in command of an entire legion. To put this in a more familiar context, can you imagine MacArthur or Patton overseeing an operation and the soldiers ignoring their orders? The destruction of Jerusalem happened at the hands of a crazed mob, not a disciplined Roman legion. With a firm foundation laid, it's time to peer into the future. We talk a lot about the tribulation and the players involved. Christ is, of course, our favorite. We know he will rescue his followers, put an end to the wickedness, and set up what will finally be a rich, righteous government on earth. Before we get to that point, however, there's a lot of misery for the inhabitants of earth to live through. And much of that misery will be doled out by the most famous villain ever, the long-prophesied Antichrist. We also know there will be a false prophet who helps him deceive the masses, false signs and wonders, and a lot more that will unfold over the seven years of tribulation. If you followed Christian eschatology, many of these elements will be familiar to you. Did you know, however, that Islam has its own eschatological paradigm, its own set of end times, prophecies, and expectations? It does, and we're about to compare it to our beliefs about the last days. First, let's talk about the Antichrist. According to Christian eschatology, the Antichrist is a powerful, charismatic leader who will deceive many and claim to be the Messiah. He will establish a global government and religion, conquer many nations, and demand worship from all people. He will also persecute Christians and Jews and will blaspheme against God. Now, let's look at the Islamic Mahdi. According to Islamic tradition, the Mahdi is a descendant of the prophet Muhammad who hid himself roughly 1,500 years ago and who will reappear at the end of time to establish a global caliphate and bring justice to the world. He will also be a military leader who will conquer many lands. At first glance, these two figures seem quite different. But when we look closer, we start to see some striking similarities. Both the Antichrist and the Mahdi are described as charismatic leaders who will establish a global government and religion, at first through deceptive peace, but later through military conquest. Both will persecute Christians and Jews. Islam teaches that rocks and trees will speak to Muslims and tell them Jews are hiding behind them and need to be killed. Both will be fixated on conquering Jerusalem. Are you seeing the picture for me here? Then there's the Islamic figure of Isa, who Islam claims to be the same person as the Christian Jesus. Except to Islam, Jesus was just a prophet, was not divine, and was pretty much just a helper paving the way for Muhammad. According to Islamic tradition, Isa will return to earth soon after the Mahdi does to help him set up his kingdom. We, of course, know Isa isn't Jesus, so who is he? The Bible warns of a false prophet who will deceive many and perform miracles in the name of the Antichrist. This is a long passage, but an important one. So let's look and listen carefully. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 11 through 17. As this passage clearly shows, this false prophet is the Antichrist right-hand man who will help him establish his global government and religion. This false prophet is almost certainly none other than Esau, who Islam will claim to be Jesus. Remember what Jesus warned us of in Matthew 24, 24? For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, 24. Think about that. This deception is going to be so good, so strong, that it will fool the masses, and if we didn't have the Holy Spirit to protect us, it would fool even us. Now let's talk about the Islamic figure of the Dajjal, who is described there as a false messiah, sort of their version of our Antichrist. Islamic beliefs claim that Isa, whom we know to be a false Jesus and almost certainly the false prophet, will battle and defeat the Dajjal, who claims to be God. Who might this Dajjal actually be? It's pretty obvious that this will be our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. We also know how that battle is going to turn out. Let's recap our quick comparison. Both the Antichrist and the Mahdi will claim to unite people in peace, then turn to military conquest. Both the Antichrist and the Mahdi will be fixated on capturing Jerusalem, the center of the earth, to God. Both the Antichrist and the Mahdi will persecute Christians and Jews. The Antichrist will have a false prophet who does signs and wonders and acts as the right-hand man of the Antichrist. The Mahdi will have a false Jesus who performs signs and wonders and acts as his right-hand man. Islam claims that a figure called the Dajjal is actually the imposter who will be battled by its false Jesus. When we combine scripture, world history, and the end times beliefs of Christians and Muslims, the result is too compelling to ignore, and in my opinion, too compelling to refute. There's also the issue of plain old common sense. Take a step back and just look at the reality of the world. We know a global battle is coming. We know that battle will have a strong religious component. We know that battle will fixate on Israel, in particular Jerusalem. All we have to do is look at what's happening right now. Where's the focus of the world? Israel. What worldview is fixated with abject hatred of Israel? Islam. What nations surround and threaten Israel? Islamic nations. If we look at a modern map of the empires from Daniel, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, and Greek, we see that these lands are now Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. All Islamic. Now, one final tidbit. Let's take a look at Revelation 24, which describes a scene John saw in heaven. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20, 4. What modern religion has a long history of beheading those who oppose it? Hint, there's only one. It's plain as day that the battle of the tribulation will be Islam versus everyone who won't bend the knee. It's also plain as day that when Jesus shows up to put an end to the Antichrist and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon, those forces will not be French, British, and German. They will be Islamic. In fact, once you start studying this issue, it's a boggle as to why it hasn't been glaringly obvious for a long time. 
Roman dogma notwithstanding. I have a hypothesis on that. I have no way to prove its validity, but I'd love to see your thoughts on it in the comments. Let's take a look at Daniel 12, 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Daniel 12, 4. I've read many commentaries claiming that this verse has nothing to do with an increase in transportation or an expansion of human knowledge in general. I prefer to read what the Bible says and let it speak for itself. I think it does refer to a time that has clearly arrived, and my hypothesis is that the obviousness of the Islamic paradigm has been supernaturally concealed from us because the book had been sealed until very recently. Now it's open, and the truth is becoming obvious to scholars, students, and anyone else who dares to take a look. I've only hit the high points of the evidence supporting the Islamic Empire as the fourth empire of Daniel and the mirrored parallels between Christian and Islamic eschatology. This evidence goes much deeper. If you want to study this issue for yourself, I strongly recommend checking out Joel Richardson. I'll link his information in the description. Let me know what you think in the comments. It's fine to disagree with me. I just ask that we always keep our debates civil and respectful. Thanks for being here, and until we meet again, this is Chop, signing off and saying Maranatha.